Thanks very much, Kevin, for that heartfelt welcome. Um, sorry, I yesterday uh, evening I made the great mistake of practicing my talk in front of my 23-year-old daughter who is a theater, who just graduated with a theater major. She was counting my ums, my so's, and talking about my hand gestures. I am of Italian descent, so hand gestures kind of like come with the territory. And um, so, so the whole age issue really um, strikes me. But it's just a number, and I'm a statistician, so I think that that works. So I want to talk to you um, first. First, I want to welcome you. We're really, really excited. I came to the University of Michigan about 10 years ago. And um, I am an applied biostatistician. And uh, my department is absolutely wonderful, one of the top biostat programs in the nation. And in order to get ahead within the department, for the most part, you need to do methodological research. So one of the things that I've been very, very interested in is in trying to bring together applied biostatisticians across the university um, and trying to find a virtual home for them, because I think that we share a lot of the same aims, both in terms of biostatistics as well as medicine, dental, nursing, et cetera, the, the, applied, um, the applied health um, areas. So as everyone says, you, especially it's January, so you can still remember your New Year's resolutions in terms of strong abs. We would like to have a strong applied biostatistical sciences network here at the U. And we're at the stage where we really could make that happen because of the um, of Mishar and the CTSA. So if I can, so what, we're, what we want to do is we really want to improve um, health and health research by creating these partnerships and these relationships among folks at the University of Michigan, statisticians, epidemiologists, uh, researchers, data analysts, programmers, um, in order to try to um, improve health. And our current ideas are that we would have two lectures a year. So our first lecture, here we are. The thought would be is that it would be a more technical lecture talking about some aspect of innovative clinical trials. Then in June, actually in June uh, 21st, um, we have, we're really privileged to have Dr. Regina Nuzzo come here, not only because she's a paisano, but also um, she's, she's both a journalist and she has her uh, a doctorate in, um, in um, science from, um, from Stanford. But one of the things that's really important when you're an applied biostatistician, you need to be technically competent. You also need to be able to communicate statistical ideas and to communicate with our clinical colleagues. So that second lecture that we're thinking about each year for ABS would be a more soft skills type of lecture um, in terms of collaboration. So Regina's gonna be coming, one of her, one of her statements, uh, she actually won an award from ASA. She was involved in the, uh, the, the ASA, American Statistical Association paper about p-values and the role of p-values in, um, in, in health research. And I love her quote here, statistics is the grammar of science. So I think that she's, um, I think that you would really enjoy her lecture, but that's our current thinking about the lecture series, series within ABS. The other thing is then is that quarterly we'd like to meet, so in March and in September, um, we would have um, networking meetings of, of meetings for our network members. The first one in March, you know, missing data is ubiquitous. It's something that statisticians and clinical researchers have to deal with. And so um, we would like to go and focus our efforts on missing data. We happen to have some um, world-renowned experts in our department, so Rod Little will be, um, will be in, in, involved in that. September is wide open. So one of the things that we'd like to do, you'll see, as Shukafe was mentioning, is that first of all, we really would like, um, like you to sign up for ABS. Um, and then we also have an evaluation sheet here. Um, and we welcome your ideas. And in fact, um, we are still working on how to put forward this missing data um, workshop. 
because we'd like to make it actually um, you know, more, more hands-on, so per, perhaps providing a data set, having you analyze the data set, getting your hands dirty, and then coming together and seeing how someone like Rod Little or Trevor Laurie Raghunathan in the department or other, other folks who have a lot of experience with missing data, how would they handle it? So it makes it a little bit more real. It also means you have to do a little bit more investment, but I, we think that that could be very useful. So. If missing data is your thing, or if you've always wanted to learn about missing data, never took the time, sometimes joining something like this, like the planning committee, will help you, um, you know, read those papers that you have been planning to read for the last seven years. Just say it. Okay. Um, we have a, um, a website that's under construction. Um, and the other thing that I, that I just want to uh, mention is to participate. Your input is important. Where we go with this idea really depends upon the enthusiasm, the ideas, the engagement of, of, um, of statisticians, epidemiologists, uh, data analysts. And our first focus is really going to be on the, status, the, the stat, the technical people. And then in year two and year three, we'll be bringing in also um, clinical, more of the clinical researchers in terms of a conversation about how our applied biostatisticians at the University of Michigan may better able serve some of the needs of the clinical researchers. So that's that, okay? So now I wanna talk to you about the more um, technical piece about looking at adaptive designs um, as Kevin had mentioned, uh, I, I don't know actually if you mentioned, but I have a 10-year career in the pharmaceutical world. Um, I worked at Pfizer here in Ann Arbor in the cardiovascular area. So the example that I'm going to be talking about derives from that work in industry. And one of the things that I think that makes an adaptive design very interesting is that it's complicated. And then you have an awful lot of data so how do you go and communicate those ideas um, to the clinical team and to make decisions? And for example, this example that I'm going to be talking about, we had a team of 10 to 15 individuals work six months, and we had 10 minutes with upper management at Pfizer to go and tell them um, to summarize six months of work and to pitch the idea. Okay. So luckily in academia, I get, usually get a little bit more than 10 minutes with my clinical colleagues. Uh, it kind of depends though, but you get the idea, right? Okay, so, so I've already talked to you about the ABS network. Um, just a little bit of outline. I wanna provide some context to why we were interested in adaptive designs. Introduce adaptive designs for those of you that don't know what an adaptive design is, and then go into the particular example, okay? So, in the late 1990s, early 2000s, one of the things that the FDA and the pharmaceutical um, companies were seeing is that, is that um, clinical trials were expensive. So the cost of the clinical trials in terms of industry R&D spending in billions was increasing. And yet the return on investment in terms of actually having a new, um, a new drug approved was pretty flat, okay? So very expensive to um, develop drugs. Also, they are lengthy um, and there's a big attrition rate. So this is one of the slides about the attrition that can occur with, um, within, the pharma, within the pharma world. So, so I just wanna speak about, about this first, so that there are like millions of compounds that may be screened, then they go into preclinical pharmacology, uh, preclinical safety, the tox types of studies. Uh, preclinical just means either in, you know, in vitro or in animal model, so that's the discovery phase of development. And then we move into the human phase of, of clinical trials, so phase two, just um, um, can we go and, and get, how do we administer the drug? What's the right dose? Um, we always, during any time that we're working with humans, we always are looking at safety through all, all phases. 
But this is the exploratory development phase, phase one, and then phase two. Phase two is actually my favorite part of clinical trials because there I think that you have the most freedom and, and, and can be most innovative in terms of trying to make decisions. Phase three, um, so in phase two you're trying to go, and again, always learning about safety. Uh, sometimes in phase one it's within um, healthy volunteers. When you get into phase two, it's, it's, within, um, it's within patients who have the disease. Um, we're trying to go, again, get more information about what is the right dose, and then some preliminary activity or efficacy. And then if all goes well, then you move on to the phase three phase. Uh, full development, there also is a phase four for post-marketing um, types of studies. You know, on average, it's about 12 years, up to 15 years, for when the, um, the, the, co the compound is, is targeted by the company to say, yep, this is one that we want to we wanna explore more until you actually have an approval. Another way to look at the probability of success is a different study that was done. This is looking at 10 years of data from 2000 to 2015. And what they looked at is a wide, this is all pharma, it's not investigator initiated study. So these are all pharma, um, pharma studies that are geared toward um, getting a drug approved and getting it um, out, to, out to patients. And so if we look at the attrition rate just overall from phase one to an approval of a drug is less than 10%. So, you know, it's probably like I'm going to be going to Vegas with my 92-year-old dad in a few weeks. Um, this is probably what, um, you know, I watch him bet because, you know, he gives me $20 for the day. I get, I lose it in 10 minutes at the slot machines and he goes on, uh, I don't know, he's got the right genes because his rate is much better. But this actually, this actually is only slightly better than chance. Because if you think about if it's 50% to go from phase one to phase two, two to three, three to uh, the NDA or the BLA is the actual submission, um, then to approval, um, you know, that's about, that's about 5%. So we're doing you know, slightly better, um, actually it's about 6%. So we're doing slightly better with the last 10 years. But this is still, um, you know, you'd be better off to bet on the Patriots in the Super Bowl. Lived in Boston for 16 years, so yeah. Okay, so, so the context for thinking about adaptive designs is that when the FDA and pharma looked at this in 2004, the FDA, um, came up with a critical path initiative. And one of the things that they encouraged in this critical path initiative was more development in innovative clinical trials. And so that provided us with the impetus to be looking more carefully and, and about adaptive designs. Many people call adaptive designs flexible designs. And one of the things that we're trying to do with adaptive designs is to have, um, to make use of, um, to have like multi-stage, multi-stages in a clinical trial and then look at the accumulative, um, accumulating information over time to modify aspects of the study. So that sounds like a great idea. The caveat is, is you have to do so in a way that still gives you the validity that you could get with a conventional design and also that we preserve the integrity of the study in terms of some of the operational biases that could occur as people learn what is happening at these various stages of the study. What do we usually do in a standard or conventional? We use what's called a fixed trial design, okay? So we, 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 we get as much information as we can, and what we do is we say, okay, so I want alpha of, of 5%, type 1 error of 5%, I want to have high power, 90% power, 80% power, I want to go in and um, this is the patient population that I'm interested in, I'm going to randomize people 50% to placebo and to the experimental drug, I'm going to have this many, sample, um, this many patients in order to have this much of an effect, and that's it. Okay, that is a beautiful design. Don't get me wrong, that's a beautiful design. As long as all of your assumptions that you made in designing the study and coming up with the sample size and knowing about the population, if all of them are right. How many of you have been involved in designing a clinical trial? Raise your hand high, be proud, be proud. Okay, um, I want you to raise your hand again. How many of you 
have found, uh, have been involved in that same trial that you designed, and those assumptions were met. <coughs> For the record, I have three. Okay, uh, very unusual. Good for you, um, but that's that's not the usual. That's not the usual um, situation. So, what can adaptive designs do for us? Is that they can take into account some of that uncertainty about the assumptions that are used to design the study. Notice that it's not a panacea. It's not going to take care of all of all of the problems that could arise. But but it helps you identify what are some of the key key assumptions that you're making, and perhaps do some type of sensitivity analysis to design the study to take care of them. Because as we statisticians know, we're pretty dang wonderful. <laughs> right, right? And you know, we're magicians. But to be very honest, if the design is not appropriate, then an analysis can't take care of a poor design or a design that's flawed. So that's why, for me, the, what I love most is designing of the trials. Analysis is kind of fun, but, and it's necessary, but the design is really, for me, where it's at and where I have the most, where I have the most fun, okay? So let's continue then. So um, in 2006, um, 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 Vladimir Drag Dragobin, um, and I'm probably not saying his name properly, but he created a taxonomy for thinking about adaptive designs, various rules that you could um, use to think about um, how you can either, both from a fixed trial design perspective or from an adaptive trials design perspective, what you could change. So there are four rules to consider. And you could just go and have an adaptive design that only is looking at one of these rules, or you could have even more flexibility and look and, and perhaps modify all four of these. So allocation rule means how many subjects you're gonna to allocate to each of the treatment arms in your study. What is the most common one? One to one. So if you've got placebo against an experimental or standard of care against experimental, um, statisticians will tell you that the best design, most efficient is one to one randomization. But you can modify that. And we'll, we'll talk about some examples later, um, later on in a couple of slides. You could also change the sampling rule. So the sampling rule is that how many subjects are gonna be sampled at the next stage. Stopping rules, many people are really familiar with this because even though adaptive designs are kind of sexy now, some of the designs have been around since the 60s. And some of the 60s was before I was born, okay? Um, but. Um, but um, probably many of us are familiar with sequential, um, sequential stopping rules, so stopping a trial for benefit, um, because we know that the experimental is better than the control. Um, we also can stop for harm. We're always looking for, for at safety, um, for usually for phase three with a data safety and monitoring board. They're looking at safety, even if we don't have explicit rules in the protocol for that. And then we can also be stopping for futility, where we're doing an interim analysis during the trial and we find out that there is a very, very low probability that we would be able to achieve the study's objectives um, because, um, because maybe our assumptions aren't right or something has happened to the patient population. Um, you know, science has progressed. So stopping rules are something that many, many um, folks who are working in clinical trials are already aware of, but that actually falls under the adaptive design paradigm. And then decision rules are kind of like anything else. So decision rules might be, for example, um, it's possible to move that um, from non-inferiority design of a study to superiority or back and forth. Um, you know, um, there are EMA guidelines that talk about that. Um, another way is thinking about changing the, um, the population from all subjects to maybe um, a group that is um, biomarker positive, for example, so a sub, um, subpopulation. So there's, um, there's lots of room to go and um, uh, modify aspects of your trial based on accumulating data. Key features of an adaptive design. So when I was at Pfizer, they said, always consider adaptive designs. So they wanted us to you know, push forward that innovation envelope. But the issue is this, is that if you have a very common drug and you're gonna have enough sites and you can enroll the study in 11 months and your primary outcome is at two years, 
you're not necessarily going to be able to influence, um, you know, to, to adapt because you're moving too quickly. So it's the combination of your recruitment and the timing of your primary endpoint that allows you to contemplate um, how, much you can, how much you can adapt. The other thing that's really, really important is that you also need time this is for, for, I mean, software is being developed by some really, really great minds and good companies. But for example, I mean, if you wanted me to do a conventional design in five, if you give me all of the things that I need in five minutes, I can go to East, I can go to SAS, I can go to a lot of different um, soft, uh, software, and I can come up with your, with your answer. What's the size? What's the operating characteristics of that fixed design? With, with uh, an adaptive design, for the most part, you're going to go and have to work with a statistician who is going to be running clinical trial simulations, and that takes more time. The idea is, is that that time at the beginning may give you better uh, operating characteristics for your study. So operating characteristics, the getting the right dose, um, getting, the, getting the right answer, um, having bounds on the types of errors that you could be making, your false positive, your false negative. Those are all types of operating characteristics. Another operating characteristic might be that you want to go and minimize, um, uh, mini minim minimize um, uh, some side effect that's known for that drug. And you don't want it to go too, too high. That could be something that you're keeping tabs of and is a metric for your study. And so that would be another type of operating characteristic. So it takes time. OK? Now, I did tell you that I was Italian. So I'm gesticulating. And you could let Anna, my daughter, know that this was the appropriate time. If there are only two things from this lecture, and that's the, the third thing is that you've got a Zingerman's lunch. So that you're already ahead of the game here. But if there's only two things that you remember from this lecture, it's these two slides, OK? An adaptive design is not an opportunity to start a trial and then figure it out, OK? Absolutely not. And it requires much more planning than the conventional trial. So two main messages. OK, so you can go and leave the room or sleep or just continue eating, OK? Some pros and cons. Yes, sir? I'm wondering the outcome issue, that many times our outcomes are delayed. I assume there's no risk, but it is, is it reasonable to do an adaptive design where you adapt to a biomarker or surrogate marker that appears at two weeks and your outcome might take 16 weeks? Yes. Um, when I first started, when I first started after I, I graduated, I was working in HIV. And so we were looking, instead of looking at um, mortality and or morbidity, we were looking at CD4 and viral load. So many times the phase two program was looking at those kind of more interim markers. The issue there, though, is this issue of surrogacy. Many times I think that we use the word surrogacy in the wrong way. Because many times we have a biomarker or an outcome that is correlated, but it may not necessarily be a surrogate in the sense that the effect of the drugs on, you have to have some confidence that the effect of the drugs on that intermediate outcome, the purported surrogate outcome, is the same as what you would get when you go and look at that longer term, maybe more meaningful clinical outcome. Does that make sense? Good. OK. Um, you know, I'm happy, happy to take questions. That does have an, an inversely correlated with my ability to end on time, but I will be staying here um, after after the talk, and I'd be you know happy to happy happy to answer more questions. So I would love to be able to have more dialogue. Um, so if you have a burning question, feel free. Okay. So pros and cons. Uh, pros is that we can actually have more efficiency in terms of fewer number of patients, a shorter duration of the study. Um, it could be uh, reducing costs. Um, it may, may lead to shorter duration. That may be actually on average. Because when you're doing this adaptation, sometimes you don't know, are you going to follow this path in terms of the adaptation, or that path, or that path? So a lot of times we can, with an adaptive design, say, what is the maximum sample size? A lot of times what we'll do is we'll just go and characterize it in terms of what's the average size. And maybe the average size is actually going to be less than the conventional. 
Um, we, um, we want to design it so that we're going to be more likely to succeed. And this is kind of funny. Sometimes people think about the fail quickly. But actually, that is a tremendous advantage to anyone. If the drug is not going to be working, my god, wouldn't you like to know about it in the first couple of years as opposed to five or six years, six years later? Um, uh, I, I want to talk about this issue about patient protection. One of the things that I think that's, to me, absolutely fascinating that I love is, you know, with clinical trials, we're experimenting with human beings. So there's this in incredible imperative to be ethical and be thinking about the fact that we are experimenting with human beings. And I think that one of the reasons that I'm glad that I'm a statistician and not a clinical researcher is I don't have to have that conversation with a patient that says, you know, I really don't know what to do, okay? I, there's some equipoise here, right? You need to have that clinical equipoise in order to be able to randomize subjects to certain types of studies, or certain types of, of, of therapies. So one of the things that happens in the clinical trial is that we're not necessarily um, optimizing for that, that patient, are we? We're thinking about doing the study to go and improve the health of future study or future subjects, right? And sometimes within an adaptive design, we can actually do some things that might be able to provide some more benefit or more protection to the patients that are in our that are in our study, or at least maybe for the next stage of patients when we're thinking about adaptive designs as being multi-stage clinical trials. Um, and also, what's really interesting here, you're going to look and say, Kathy, you're out of your mind because you have flexibility. Uh, as a pro and as a, as a con. But so, so it's great that you can have flexibility, but sometimes all of that flexibility can get in the way in terms of trying to go and understand operating characteristics and what some of the, um, um, so, so sometimes it can make it harder. So that complexity, making the results being harder to interpret, harder to conduct. Because for example, with, um, for example, if, if I were going and modifying the res, you know, re, um, response adaptive randomization, I have to have, a mechanism by which, as the study is going on, that when you know a coordinator calls in for the random number, that I've changed that that allocation ratio. Um, if I am changing how the drugs based upon gathered information over the the course of the study, which dose or changing some other aspect of the drug, I need to have a drug delivery system that will take care of that as well. So operationally, adaptive designs. Um, can, can, be, um, can be harder to conduct. I spoke just very briefly about operational bias. There is an incredible literature about operational biases, uh, which actually operate even within conventional uh, clinical trials. But um, that also is something that um, has been raised by both regulatory and other clinical trialists as an issue with adaptive designs. Um, there, are, there are some strategies to combat that, though. Okay. So examples of adaptive design, it goes across the gamut from phase one to phase three. Um, continual reassessment method um, is as a method to go and try to more quickly identify a maximum tolerated dose. Um, those of you that are in the cancer world here at U of M, you know that Jeremy Taylor and his group, uh, they're, they, they have really poo-pooed and my understanding is not allow the standard three plus three type of design, they really are pushing the, uh, I think very appropriately, the continuous reassessment method. Um, this actually was an idea by O'Quigley, um, I'm trying to remember when it was, but it was um, um, like 1990, something like that. So some of these ideas about the adaptive design actually have been around for, for a while. Uh, phase two, um, uh, Guillen's phase two design, so the idea there is that you're trying to go and estimate the right, uh, the right um, activity of response for a certain drug, and so there's, there's two different stages, and his ideas were to go and be able to go and make use of the information from both of the stages in, um, in order to go and have statistically um, um, valid inference. Um, um, phase three, group sequential types of design, sample size re-estimations are both examples of adaptive designs in the phase three world, okay? So that's, you guys know that there are whole classes, right? There are whole, um, you know, semester worth of classes that talk about adaptive designs. So you know all that you need to know about adaptive designs in five minutes, okay? So not true. Um, but I hopefully it gave you kind of like this overview um, of, of what some of the um, some of the big ideas are for adaptive designs. So now I want to talk about um, the particular adaptive dose ranging study. And um, 
one of the things that I found really curious is that I, I was involved in more adaptive designs in pharma than I've been able to accomplish here at U of M in the 10 years that I've been here. And I, I think that, that one of the things that I think that I would like to be working on within MISHAR is to making sure that we've got the infrastructure that's necessary so that we can really move forward with more of these adaptive types of designs. The other thing that people have said is that, well, you know, I hear about it all the time, but, you know, is it ever actually implemented and is it published? And I can tell you, well, at least our study was published. Um, it was published, when was it published? Uh, 20, 2013, something like that. So, you know, it can be, you know, it can lead to publication. It can be conducted, um, but you just need to, um, uh, you, need, you need to have some of that infrastructure necessary, both in terms of design and in terms of the actual conduct of the study, and then also a statistician that knows how to go and put the pieces together at the end in terms of the analysis. Okay, so a long, long time ago, I saw Star Wars a couple of weeks ago, um, we had warfarin, so I was in uh, Pfizer, I was working in the cardiovascular area, and we were trying to go and find a replacement for warfarin, which those of you in the know know it's rat poison, right? And that there are more sales for warfarin as a rat, rat, rat poison, say that 10 times quickly, um, than there is for what it is intended. Um, so it's at the time when we were developing our product, warfarin was the only oral anticoagulant available. So they had the heparins, the low molecular weight heparins. Uh, most of them were given parenterally. So um, we were seeking to find an oral anticoagulant. And you might say, why? Because one of the things that's, that's very interesting with warfarin is that you have to monitor it. So the patients have to come in. They have to go give a blood test. You get their INR. Then you modify the dose. So it's, you know, it's, it's a drag. So what we were trying to, to do is to see if we could come up with um, a, 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 a different approach using a different drug. One of the things that you'll see is th that underpins all of this talk is that when we're talking about an anticoagulation, dose, dose selection is everything. You might argue that dose selection is everything, whatever the disease is. But particularly with anticoagulations, we're trying to find that tipping point if you're thinking about being on a teeter-totter. If you overdose someone, you have a problem that they could bleed, right? Because these are blood thinners. You thin the blood too much, you can bleed. So then you need transfusions and lots of other, other things. If you underdose, then what happens is that you've got clot formation. You've got a thrombus forming. So we're trying to find out that perfect little balancing spot to make sure that, um, that, that we're not giving too much drug, we're not giving too, too little drug. So we had um, a compound, and you know, once again, it's that lovely name. Actually, it's a lot easier for me to say PD-0348292 than Rizaxaban, Fondaparinax, Anoxaparin, Daltaparin, and Zemegalacatran, okay? So anyway, um, that I also think for applied statisticians is probably among the more difficult things that we need to do. So I can say heteroscedasticity 10,000 times, but when I have to say Zemegalacatran, um, it, it stops me. So that was supposed to be humorous, but maybe it wasn't, because <laughs> maybe, maybe it hurts too much, statisticians, you know, the fact that we can't keep up with our clinical colleagues in terms of um, appropriate saying the drug names. But this is, you know, very, very, very common. One of the things when they came and we were talking and developing this Factor 10A uh, product, when it came to me, they had already done the first um, phase one study, so they had single dose and multiple dose and healthy volunteers, and it looked like it was, looked like a good drug. Okay, and it had already gone through all that preclinical stuff. Um, it had really good uh, PK property, pr pharmacokinetic properties. And one of the things that was really interesting about this drug, which made it kind of exciting to us, is because when we're, we're trying to find that, that point, that right dose. And so if you have a really uh, large dose range, that's a good place to be, because then that gives us more, more, um, more action, if you will, in terms of you know, a low dose or high dose. And it was, had a hundredfold uh, dose range for us to look at from 0.1 to 10 milligrams. Okay, and the competition out there were low molecular weight um, heparins, uh, fonded Paranax, which was an indirect factor, ten, uh, factor 10A inhibitor. Um, um, drugs like warfarin coumadin v, um, were vitamin um, K antagonists. And they're, they're effective, but they always had some problems like being taken parenterally or needing to be monitored. And so what we wanted to do 
within the company is find that right dose of our drug to balance efficacy and safety. And we chose a model, um, total knee replacement. You know, Warfarin came out looking at, um, looking at um, oh, for goodness, um, looking at stroke prevention in AFib. That, that's a much harder, that's a much uh, harder um, area to work with in terms of phase two. So the gentleman that was talking about this earlier, it's a lot easier because, you know, folks after total knee or total hip replacement are already in kind of like um, they're predisposed to, to thrombus formation. And so that was a good, good model. So there was a lot of discussions that went into that, but that was the decision that was made. The other decision or, or goal that we had is to go and try to find the dose not a dose, because when you go into phase three, it doesn't double the cost of the drug program, but it certainly increases it a lot if you have to go and study two drugs in phase three as opposed to just one drug. So what, that's, that, was, that was the goal. Find, find the right dose and only take one dose into phase three. When we were looking at, <coughs> excuse me, typical um, phase, two, phase two programs, one of the things that we had seen with the competitors is that they were using a, um, a strategy where they were trying to find the maximum tolerated dose in phase one. And then what was happening is that when they got into the phase two world and they used the conventional design. So what's happening in the conventional design, you might have one or two doses that you're, you're studying, um, fixed sample size, fixed a allocation. And what was happening is that that there was not control of the major bleed, so the Timmy major bleeding rate. And so that we were having, um, so that because they only chose one or two doses, and you don't know a lot after doing a small phase one study, maybe with 12 patients, 15 patients, so what's the right dose to, to take? And what was happening at these major bleeds, so what happens when somebody has a major bleed? They might go and drop out of the study. And so that at the end of the phase two program, you had insufficient data to go and say, what's the lowest dose that's going to be, um, give us uh, potential efficacy and be safe, okay? All of these things were in the minds of my Pfizer colleagues, and then they helped me get it into my mind. So what we decided that we wanted to do is to not take the conventional path that a lot of the other factor 10As or thrombin inhibitors um, were, were using. And so what we decided to do is that instead of just looking at the dose-response relationship, that was important for us, it was a secondary outcome, looking at the dose-response relationship, what we wanted to do is we said, okay, we know that people are using anoxaparin. So let's go and see if we could go and find a dose that would be comparable to anoxaparin, okay, a low molecular weight heparin. And they were giving, the, the, the most standard dose was 30 mg BID twice a day. Um, so we decided that we weren't gonna have a placebo group, we were gonna have an active control. That already is a bit, bit unusual. And then what we wanted to do is explore that entire dose range, and we wanted to have two primary endpoints. Guess what they were, major bleed, and VTEs, so venous thromboembolism, so that would be deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary embolisms, okay? So we decided that we wanted to go with an adaptive design. So all, all, all great. Okay, so how do you go about an adaptive design? I've mentioned before that you need to run clinical trial simulation. So what does that mean, a clinical trial simulation? That means that I need to simulate the data. So we had said that we wanted to go and, and, and um, look at two primary endpoints, so um, VTE and major bleed. So we need to have some model, some way to go and say, what in our patient population, what would we expect our drug to do? So we needed to be able to simulate that. So what we did is that we developed, um, we modeled the dose-response relationship for the two outcomes for our drug relative to other drugs. And our scientist came up with a um, biomarker based on thrombin generation, and they were able to do in vitro testing to look at um, thrombin generation as the biomarker to look at um, efficacy um, for a class of five different, di five different drugs, those drugs that I pronounced so eloquently, Rizaxaban and Fondaparinox, both of which are factor 10 A's, and then anoxaparin, daltaparin, and so melagatrin.
okay? So two which are low molecular weights and one that's a direct thrombin inhibitor. So what we had is that we went and we found out what was the biomarker response, and then what we wanted to do is then, because we could measure it not only in those other drugs, but also in our drug, all right, because it's in vitro, so we knew what the, that response was, and then what we did is model that response relative, we went to the literature and we looked at what are the, the, the major bleeding rates and what are the uh, VTE rates, okay, from the clinical literature. We linked it all together in these models, and we were able then to go and estimate the dose, okay? So uh, I don't want to get too, too, um, too, too much into detail here, but just a couple of things because this is some, the way that I'm going to be presenting a lot of the data to you. So since we have two primary endpoints, one endpoint is efficacy. So this is looking at DVT response, um, and this one is looking at bleeding. This is looking on the x-axis, we have the biomarker response, and then you can see our five drugs. And, and then here is our drug. A couple of things to note, these two, the green and the yellow, uh, what is that color, whatever, orangish, those are the two factor 10 A's. So if you just kind of like look quickly at this, you could see that it looks like they're a little bit different than the other guys. What's the other thing that you notice, statisticians? Variability, pretty, pretty variable, right? So what we're trying to do is to try to look at the data that we have here, and one of the things that we found is that we felt that we really couldn't have one model. We actually had what we felt were two models because we got different answers depending upon if we just said, is our drug more like the factor 10A inhibitors? Or is our drug more like this whole group of anticoagulants that were, that were under study? And, and the way that you could kind of see this here, so here is what anoxaparin had. And when you look at just kind of like the, the, the mean effect, that you could go and see that if we just looked at the factor 10A drugs to go and provide the model, then our selected dose that would be comparable to anoxaparin would be more, maybe a little bit less than 0.5. And if you look over here about where if we use the all drugs model with all five of them, you could see it's actually a greater than one. Okay, now that's just for one of our outcomes, right? The efficacy outcome. If we go then and use the other clicker, then we could go and look at um, bleeding, nice red color here, unfortunately. But here, under the factor 10A model, you could go and see that it's a little bit, you know, between 0.5 and 1. Here, it's a little bit more than 1. So what are you seeing? You're seeing that which model we used gave us slightly different answers. Also, what endpoint we used gave us slightly different answers. Make sense? Does that make sense from the data that I've shown so far? Okay. So another common theme that you can see is you can present data in a table, right? Or you could present data in graphs. And I'll be honest with you, I like both. I feel like tables sometimes can be richer. You give you a lot of, you know, all of the caveats and things like that. But again, when you've got one minute with a senior vice president, um, this graph works just as well and makes probably more sense to them. So what, what's the, and they're, and they're comparable, giving you the same information. So here what we have is that we have the dark line is our estimated uh, efficacy, DVT rate. The, the, um, the red is the major bleed. And so you could see over here, so we're looking at those rates relative to the dose of our drug. And then we could see the little star tells us what anoxaparin is. Okay, so if you go down and say anoxaparin, if we're using the factor 10A model, so just like what we were talking about before, that value there is less than 0.5. And if we go back here, guess what? Uh, less than 0.5, and in fact, it's 0.38. Does it really matter that it's 0.38? Yeah, it, 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 it does in, in modeling, but to get the point across here, so, if you're talking about DVTs in this model, it's here. If you're talking about major bleeds, it's a little bit higher. But the real cool thing is like, whoa, look at how different these are. And in particular, if you have them on the same panel, you can go and see that you get different answers depending upon what model, okay? So that's kind of a, an easier way to go and get those main messages across. So, 
So we, the, the good news is that we had a mechanism by which we could go and generate data for our clinical trials simulations. Okay, and so what is the purpose of these clinical trial simulations is to go and describe what the operating characteristics are among different comparators. And it's not just even like what the comparative models are. So I could have a conventional model. I could use um, some research that was done by, um, by Peter Thal at MD Anderson called FTOX, which uses two um, endpoints. So that's, that's, that's really cool. Um, we could go, there's lots of different, there's lots of different designs that we could use, but then we had all of these decisions that needed to be made within each design, in, in many ways like with a conventional type of design. So are you going to go and um, have a binary outcome? Is it the proportion of patients who die, or is it the time to event? The time to death, so more of a survival. Um, um, or are you going to use some type of continuous outcome? So there's lots of decisions that need to be made. And if you take all of those decisions and magnify it more or expand it more, you've got more opportunities within adaptive designs to be looking at some of these decisions, okay? So what we had to do before you could go and do any type of design, we statisticians know, is that you need to know what questions you're trying to answer and what are the objectives of the study. So I had given kind of like the development objectives, but then how do we look at a study objectives? So we knew that our patient population was folks that were going to have total knee replacement, and we know that we needed to estimate the dose of our drug that was equivalent to anoxaparin um, for VTEs. And so, what, so, so, so what, what does that mean, that it's equivalent to anoxaparin? We had to define what that meant more statistically or operationally. Right, so what we did is that we said that we needed to have a higher probability, we had needed to have a high probability that both the efficacy and the safety rates of the drug at the selected dose was gonna be similar. So high probability, how high is high, guys? About 5-4. No, it's about, we, we decided about 80%, right? 80%, could we have used 90? Darn well, could we have used 75? For sure. So one of the things that we looked at is that what is this um, combination? Should we use 80%? Did that give us good enough answers in terms of the operating characteristics for our study? We also said, okay, it had to be similar. Well, how do you define what similar is? So we were looking at it on a relative scale. We were looking at odds ratios using logistic models um, of looking at our, our dose relative to anoxaparin, and we chose 1.3. We also looked at 1.5, 1.1, et cetera, to see, again, um, which, which served us best, okay? And then we always wanted to go and characterize the dose response, okay? Um, how am I doing on time here, Shukafe? Bravo, okay, I'm, I'm in good shape then. Okay, so we considered at least six different types of designs, and because I only have half an hour, I'm only gonna talk about two of them. Okay, and one of them is a non-adaptive, more traditional, conventional type of design. We decided to go with parallel group. Makes sense in this thing, uh, this, this, this arena, we couldn't use um, crossover. We wanted to do, look at it across a wide dose range. We actually looked at both Bayesian and non-Bayesian types of methods. Um, and, 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 and in our particular situation, because we were looking at trying to achieve so many different type of objectives in the end, we decided, and we looked at the characteristics, that we didn't gain that much extra benefit by using Bayesian methods, and it added to the complexity of the adaptive design. So we decided to go, I'm a frequentist, but I opened up my heart to the Bayesians in our group and learned a lot. Um, but, um, but in this particular situation, we decided to go with non-Bayesian, more frequentist types of, of, of methods. And in and, and here, the allocation rule, we had, we'd, we'd have fixed randomization, we would have a fixed sample size, we would not do any interim analyses. Um, and then the decision rule at the end, um, just as done with many types of, of, of trials, that we would go um, and do pairwise comparisons of each of the doses relative to anoxaparin, okay? The other, the other design that we considered is the adaptive design, otherwise I wouldn't have a talk. Um, and what we did is that we wanted to modify the design characteristics in terms of adding or reducing doses based upon either excessive uh, VTEs, okay, so, so bad efficacy, 
and then also the safety in terms of the major bleeds. So what we wanted to do in terms of if we you know, follow that taxonomy of adaptive designs, what we would do is that we would go and uh, drop or add doses, which is part of the allocation rule. Um, sampling, we would go and have sample size reassessment for the next stage of the study. So we would be doing multiple interim analyses. And we had a special name for those interim analyses. They were dose decision rules, OK? They were DDRs. Um, and then we could go, we also very, very, um, very, very concerned about bleeding. So we also had uh, the possibility of looking at early termination of some of the inferior doses because of bleeding. And then the decision rule was estimating the equivalent dose. So it's an estimation as opposed to a hypothesis testing situation. And so the goal was to go and find that equivalent, that equivalent dose according to criteria that I talked about. Uh, talked about before. Okay, so, um, okay, I know that I changed some slides, so I just wanted to see, okay. So, the clinical trials um, uh, allowed us to look at a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of different designs, okay? And so what we wanted to do is that we went and we used that dose response model for both, our, both of our endpoints, and then we simulated the outcome of each trial a thousand times, okay? And that was by, so, so, so like if you think about what your alpha error is, right, or what a p-value is, is that, you know, if you ran it a hundred times, and five times out of 10, you're gonna go and get a false positive error. So we <coughs> use the machinery of the clinical, uh, of the simulations, that 1,000, to say how many times out of a thousand did we have a trial where we got the right dose? Now how do we know what the right dose is? because we knew from the model what it should be. So we inputted that. So this is beautiful about clinical trials, simulations, is that we know the truth. So that's why all of those symbols are Greek, because Greeks give us the truth. And unfortunately, my Latin Roman ancestors, we use kind of like those symbols to go and tell us the actual, but anyway, I digress, so let's continue. So what we did is that we looked at a lot of, of, of different operating characteristics, looking at trial performance, looking at a lot of metrics. What's our primary outcome? We wanna go and find the dose that's close to anoxaparin. So that was really important to us. So we were looking at the probability of identifying the dose. It's very similar to that construct of power, right? We wanna have high power, high probability of achieving our primary uh, goal of the study. We also were very, very interested in the num keeping the number of major bleeds and the number of VTEs in the population that we were studying. And then there's a lot of other things, looking at conditional power in terms of pruning or uh, pruning, reducing a dose, um, adding a dose. Um, what's the likelihood of making a mistoke, mistake? So at the, first, at the first interim analysis, that we delete the dose that's actually the right dose. Because so, once again, we would know that because we're simulating the data. And then what we did is that, so for each type of design, we also tried to look at some sensitivity to sample size, what doses, how many doses are we looking at initially? Are we looking at the four lowest doses? Are we looking at the four highest doses? Does it change if we use the five lowest doses as opposed to the five highest doses? So all of those types of, of decisions, we can go and simulate and change and look at the characteristics, okay? So, like I said, for each of these, we could go and give a nice little, little sheet that nobody would read besides the team. Um, I want to go into just a couple, of, a couple of, of, of details here to give you a flavor in an adaptive design about some of the decisions that are made. So conceptually, you could think about, okay, so we want to go and explore this entire dose range, but we're a little bit concerned because we don't know if the factor 10A model works or the all drug model works in terms of our drug. And so we want to make sure that we're not going to go and um, you know, have major, uh, major bleed problems, right? Because you always want to go is try to maximize the dose, right? But still to, to improve efficacy, but still maintain safety, right? So conceptually, we thought that we had um, three different criteria to think about adding or reducing pruning different doses. So one is looking at efficacy. So we want to prune a dose that has excessive VTEs. We want to prune a dose that has excessive bleeds. And then what we want to do is that if we're just saying, you know, because, because 
we want to start low and then go high. Okay, I'm stopping myself from saying something that's political. So, okay, so starting low, going high. Um, but we want to go higher. When would we feel comfortable with going higher? When we have some pretty good evidence from our trial, not just the model, but our trial, that we could go to the higher dose range and that it still would be acceptable in terms of the major bleed. So conceptually, that makes sense. Everybody still awake? You're nodding? Yeah, that makes sense. The question is that, okay, so how do we operationalize that? Okay, so um, again, I don't want to necessarily go into the, uh, all of the details, but just to say that this is necessary. We had to say, what would we be doing in the study? So we're going to go if the one-sided 90% lower confidence bound of the estimated odds ratio of looking at the factor 10A dose relative to an oxyparin, if that was greater than 1.5, then we would prune the lowest dose that met that criterion. Okay? And, you know, where did we get that? But you know what? A lot of times I find this, you know, you know what I mean? So Milt Pressler, he was, he would say that he pulled it out of his anal canal. But see, I like to pull it from the air. Okay, um, but the issue is, is that we do that all the time with conventional designs, right? In this, in this arena, uh, we're not certain, but we could go, because okay, so it's coming from here, but I could go, is 1.5 the right number? Is 1.1 the right number? Is two the right number? Should it be 90%? Should I be using the odds ratio from a logistic model? Or should I, using, should I be using some other type of, of model for binary outcomes? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We did the same thing. One thing that I want you to note as well is that, um, is that in this case, when we were looking at efficacy, we used a relative rate. And this has a little bit to do with what we had found out about anoxaparin. So we used a relative rate um, or a relative construct here. There really was an absolute threshold that our clinical colleagues would use. You know, if we had a major bleeds greater than 5% in our study, that was a big no-no, okay? So we had um, an absolute criterion for that one, okay? Then we also had rules, again, I'm not gonna get into the details here, about what were the situations where we could go and add on a higher dose. And one of them was is that we could actually, we were talking about, we could actually force a dose to be pruned, one of the lower doses to be pruned, because what we only wanted, in some sense, we've got this big dose range, so we're gonna have like this telescope. So we're only looking at five of them, we could have no more than five at any particular time. Why? A little bit of feasibility. Um, but that was a decision, that was a decision that was made as we, as we moved around. Um, this is another of those moments, table versus graph, okay? So for each of the elements, and you're not going to be able to see it, so don't, don't, don't squint from the back row, please, or even from the front row, Bev. Um, so, so what we could do, again, we've got, we've got different models. We've got, uh, this is just looking at the efficacy outcome. We could also look at the, the, um, the safety outcome. So you could go and make these nice little tables, and you could say, what's happening with the factor 10A model? What's happening with the all drugs model? So what's the probability of pruning, not pruning at all? What's the probability of pruning four arms? What's the probability of, of adding arms? Um, but you could actually go and see that with these graphs here. And it really kind of shows you, look at the difference here um, of, of these two graphs based upon the all drug model or the factor 10A model. So, so this, you can get a lot more information out of a, out of a graph than you can with, with a table. So that's just a, a take home message. It sometimes becomes hard to say, you know, is it 12, 12 versus uh, 14, like on the graph? But a lot of times you really don't need that. If you're just trying to go and pick up what the patterns are, what are the trade offs between one model or the other model? Okay? So at the end of the day, one of the things that I, I also I, um, I wanted to make sure that you knew is that if you're looking for internal consistency in my slides, um, sometimes they're not there. And the reason is, is that because, you know, this is from a while ago at Pfizer, so I'm just kind of like pulling different slides. So when I say that this is the recommended design, um, there are a few things, like if you look at some of my later slides or the earlier slides, it may not be exactly like this. But it still gives you, I think, the flavor, right? So what we decided to do is to do a six-arm 
okay? Parallel group with adaptive dose range. And what we were gonna be doing is that we're gonna start with five initial doses that are at the lower end, from 0.1 to 2.5. Then we could go and add on four or 10, depending upon what we learned during the study, okay? And we had fixed um, sample size of 735 evaluable subjects. They were gonna be randomized two to one to one to one to one to one, I think that's five ones, um, to our five doses of factor 10A or anoxaparin. So we wanted to have a little bit more information about anoxaparin, why? Because that's our, that's our anchor, right? We wanted to go and test against, against that anchor. And then we um, decided on our dose decision analyses, um, we defined what we were gonna do in terms of pruning or adding doses. We said that we were only gonna have four of them throughout the study after about every 147 evaluable subjects, okay? So when we went up for management, we could go and have a, a table that looked like this. And in fact, even within our local team. So, so we can go and then compare what the characteristics of the original design are, the adaptive designs. We could look at the, the total range of um, doses that we were gonna test. What are we starting with? The likelihood of identifying the right dose, 82% versus 89%. You can see the sample size, 833 versus 735. Blah, 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 okay? Um, they were just overwhelmed and so happy. Not, okay? Um, they, they, weren't, they weren't getting some of the, tra the trade-offs, and it's not become their, because they're stupid, but we've lived with this for six months. They, 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 were, they were looking at it from time to time, our clinical team and certainly the management team, um, you know, and how do, you, how do you get a sense about 100 versus 156? We also did, okay, you know, my, my favorite always pros and cons. So what are you getting in the traditional? What are you getting in the extra? You don't even need to read that because guess what? If you were an upper, you could be an upper management at Pfizer. You don't wanna read that, do you? So the thing that was really, really interesting to me is that the single, this, the, uh, this, this was our secret. And I'm not saying that it, you know, Dinesh, if you do an adaptive design, I'm not saying that this is the way to go. I'm just saying that it was really interesting to me is that to go and get your head around when you have taken you know, your clinical trials and your statistics courses and you've been taught it a certain way that it gets really, really difficult to say, okay, what's happening with these clinical trials and what assumptions are you making and what are all of these outcomes? You know, because they live, a lot of my clinical research as a, a colleagues, you know, they live in what's gonna happen. So guess what we did? We said, okay, we have 10,000 clinical trials for that, that the, the, recommended, the recommended design. So guess what we're gonna do? I'm gonna pull one out and I'm gonna show you what happens stage by stage. And then of course, we being the brilliant statisticians that we were, we chose some that we would prune, some that we wouldn't prune, some where you'd make the right decisions, some where you made, didn't make the, made the wrong decisions. And then when you say like, well then they would say, how many times did this happen? Well then I've got the, I've got the answers. I can go and say, you know, this is this, this type of scenario where we're going to go and increase the dose, you know, add four and 10 milligrams, that's going to happen 70% um, of the time. So it really helped. So um, I'm going to kind of go through, um, oh, we're, we're doing okay, but I'm going to kind of go through um, this. I'll, I'll show you how to read the, the graphs. Well, so we just went and we provided one replicate to show how we, um, lower, we prune lower doses and we add higher doses. So let's go through this together, okay? So what we have here, just like with a lot of our, um, a lot of our graphs that we've already looked at, so here's our efficacy, looking at the DVT uh, frequency. Here we have our safety bleeding, okay? So we've got two different marks on the um, Y axis. We have here is our dose of our drug, Okay, so remember, this is a clinical trial. So now I am looking at the first look of the clinical trial. I'm showing the results. Because this is a simulated clinical trial, I have the green. You can just think of that's Greek. Um, green is the truth. So that is the dose-response relationship for um, this, particu this particular scenario, okay? Um, actually, I'm trying to remember, this I think is the all drugs model. This is the all drugs model. Because in the all drugs model, what should happen? We should be increasing the dose, okay? We could go to higher doses. So this is from the all drugs model. 
Um, so these are the, the doses of, the, of factor 10A. This is anoxaparin, because remember, that's what we're comparing against. So the black dots represent the frequencies, the observed frequencies after we have 10, 10 at 0.1, 10 at 5, 10 at 1, 10 at 2.5, and then we have 20 patients, because it was a 2 to 1 to 1 to 1 to 1 ratio. We have 20 patients. This is based on 20 patients, OK? And so here's truth. Here's estimated based on this relatively small sample size, 10 for each of the experimental doses. This is the 90% confidence bound around that predicted dose-response relationship. And um, same, same over here, OK? So what do you see? You see that that lowest dose, not very efficacious, OK? It is much, much higher than the 90% lower confidence bound. We prune it. The other thing is that we were looking at is also major bleeds. There were no major bleeds out of the first 140-ish um, 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 folks, that, that first cohort. So far, so good? OK. Then look two. What happened in look two? We had, um, we had excess um, DVTs in the 0.3 milligram dose, so we pruned it. What's happening over here? If you kind of go, you could have really fun with this, but kind of like look, look and see what's changing. Wow, it tells you a lot about sampling variability, right? So, so um, and you also see that that this 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 dot never changes because it for the rest of the trial is always going to be 10 patients. We're never going to be adding any more patients when we prune that that dose at look one. That's your, you know we're only estimating 0.1 with 10 patients for the rest of the study. Okay, so now I'm, I'm now I've got 40 patients here. I've got 20 all all of them uh, are here, um, and then at the at the five five milligram dose now I've got 10 because remember they only came in from the last look. So what's happening is that you've got different um, sample sizes as you go across. You could also see that anoxaparin, whoops, we had a, uh, we had a major bleed in our anoxaparin group. OK? So we added 10 milligrams because we were able to say that the look, looking pre, we're looking pretty good right now. OK? But all good things must end. Um, then when we got to our third look, what do we see? So we start to see. That, um, that the estimated is starting to do a little bit better job of, um, of meeting, of, uh, of achieving the, the, um, the, the, est you know, the, um, the true response rate. You could see that we had a problem here in this 10 milligram. How many patients are in 10 milligram dose? 10, okay? So, so it's kind of nice that even though we're really concerned about major bleeds, the decision rules that we put together would not have us, did not have us prune that because of major bleeding. So we continued. So we looked at um, look four. We had excessive um, VTEs in the one milligram dose. So that one got deleted. Look what happened here with more patients. The second cohort of folks between look three and look four in the 10 milligram of, our, of the factor 10A. Um, so that, that, you know, none of them had one, so you could see that the estimate was reduced, okay? It might give, give everybody a little bit of gastric upset as you're looking at that interim analysis, but we a priority looked and decided upon the rules. Um, and then here's look five, look six, look seven. That series of graphs really, really helped Actually, it helped, helped me as well, the statisticians, but particularly the clinical researchers, understand what we were trying, what we were trying to do, and what really would be happening step by step. Because you know, looking at the the statistical models and the probabilities, sometimes things got lost in trans translation. Um, near the end here, so you can just hold on just a little bit longer. So what I wanted to show is that this is from the publication. So if you go to the ABS website, we actually have some supplemental material. So I actually have some of those graphs of look by look for other scenarios, other realizations of the clinical trial 
um, the, that we simulated. But this is actually, this looks kind of similar to what you've seen, except that it's in black and white because it costs too much to have color in our publications these days, right? So it shows you, here's a noxaparin. It puts both the bleeding and the um, DVTs in the same graph. So you can see you know, the predicted dose response relationship for both of our endpoints. And the other thing that I wanted to show is that, you know, in many ways, this is a very standard type of dose response um, results that we would expect to see, right? So, you know, each of the doses and what their sample sizes are, but whoa, wait a minute, that's a little bit different. This is different than the conventional because you could see that based upon this design, the adaptivity is that we actually had more patients who were at the dose that was closest to an oxaparin 30 milligrams BID, okay? So we had um, an oxaparin, we ended up having 188. We had 120 at one milligrams, 112 at 2.5. At the, the extremes, you could see that we only had 35 here and 27 there. So we're kind of like putting our money where we think that we're going to have the biggest bang for the buck. And it ended up, if you interpolated the, the actual dose based upon the model, that we actually had, we, proved, we um, estimated that it would be 1.16. So someplace, you know, someplace here. Um, the other thing that I think that's interesting is that, I'll, I'll be honest with you, a priori, I was torn because I thought that the factor 10A model, to me as a stati whoops, to me as a statistician, made more sense because we were studying a factor 10A inhibitor. But actually, when this study was run, that all drugs model actually was 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 more correct in turn relative to the factor 10A. And what our design allowed us to do is to not go and say, without any data to say which of the models was right in terms of that um, dose response, the thrombin inhibition um, model, <clears throat> we, could, we could try to go and hedge our bets. So that, that's the end of the presentation, and I just want to also acknowledge my colleagues at Pfizer who were on the, the development team. I'd be happy to answer any questions.